The Secrets of Doctor Who is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, episode 112. One day, I shall come back. That's it. I've been renewed. As when a Time Lord's body wears out, he regenerates. I'm a Time Lord. I'm not a human being. I walk in eternity. Brave hearty. Change, my dear. And it seems on a moment too soon. Unlimited vice pudding! Position, universe. Wearing a bit thin. Fantastic. I have Scottish. I can complain about things. Ta da! She'll be fine. Hi, I'm Don Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. And today we're discussing the second Doctor story, The Highlanders. Uh, joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going, Dom? Good, good. I almost forgot your last name there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I forgot to say it because I, I call you Father Corey all the time. Well, before we get into it, of course, I want to remind folks that uh, please like the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page and uh, show up there and, and join the conversation there. We have such great uh, commenters there and we get so much of our feedback from our Facebook page. And we would love for you to join us here if Facebook is a, is a place that you like to go. Uh, or, or you could... Uh, retweet us on Twitter, where we're at SQPN. You can leave comments. You can subscribe. Please do subscribe in iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, or your favorite podcast app, or on YouTube, where you should hit the bell to get notifications when we post a new episode. And please, above all, share the podcast with your friends. Help us grow our community of listeners, especially now in the, uh, we, we could almost call it the interregnum. It's not really, uh, like, or what would they be with the, the appropriate Latin phrase for between queen. But anyway, the, the interregnum uh, between seasons where we have, uh, uh, we're going through some of the older episodes. People might not think to look for a Doctor Who podcast during that time. We think, and we hope you think, that they'll enjoy mm -hmm. it. So please let people know and go to iTunes or uh, the other uh, podcast directories and leave us a review because that helps a lot when you leave a review. One last bit of uh, business uh, for for listeners for the it's a little of our network business. I want to recommend to you to go check out our new podcast, Secrets of Technology, which is a podcast that I do with, among others, Father Corey Stika here, mm -hmm. uh, where we uh, discuss the tech news from what might be a different point of view from most tech news podcasts. So uh, go check it out at sqpn.com slash technology. Uh, and our other new podcast is Catholics of Oz, which is at sqpn.com slash Oz, O-Z, which is an Australian podcast. And I mean, the content is great, but I just like to sit and listen to <laughs> friends down in Australia talk for however long the podcast is, because it's just what's better than an Australian accent. Maybe a Scottish accent is up there with it, but uh, we'll be talking about that in a second. So uh, that's do they all. Do musical numbers? Because that would be wizard. <laughs> that would be oh. wizard. <laughs> uh, so uh, ignoring that bad joke, but uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> as we, I don't know how to respond to that. Um, <laughs> so let's do a little Doctor Who news, which is that um, apparently Big Finish uh, Audio Productions, which does uh, audio plays of new, generally new Doctor Who stories, Use the, uh, using uh, the cast and actors from Doctor Who of the past, um, they're doing a set of Missy adventures starring Michelle Gomez. And as you know, Missy is uh, the current regeneration uh, or the most recent regeneration of the dark, of the master, mm -hmm. shall we say, um, and uh, played wonderfully by Michelle Gomez, one of my favorite uh, masters of all. And uh, so that should be some amazing, fun uh, scene chewing uh adventures there it's it's interesting they have a number of different master related things they're doing at the moment they have for a while they didn't have any of the actors who played the master and so they came up with their own master mm -hmm. uh their own incarnation of the master but um they have um uh, uh, uh christopher beavers 
um, who played the burnt up master that became mm. Anthony Ainley. And he's done a number of things for them, including he just wrote his own one man master play. Wow. Um, mm. Which and, and it was really quite good. Um, so you kind of get to see his vision of what he would do with the master. Uh, and then they have uh, Sir Derek Jacobi as the war master doing yep. an ongoing series of war master things. And of course, Derek Jacobi is an, 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 a, a really impressive actor. I mean, that's why he he's a knight is because okay. yep. he uh, he's such a good actor. And so you get to see multiple adventures of him. And I'm really looking forward to the Michelle Gomez Missy series. So I've already got the first set on pre-order. And it's a yeah. it's a season, right, of uh, four it's Episodes? Yeah, they're they're typically four hour sets. Sometimes that's divided into four one hour adventures. Sometimes that's divided into two two hour adventures. Okay, interesting. Yeah, it looks looks really it looks like it'd be a lot of fun. You know, um, you you can imagine she'll have her devilish, uh, crazy at atmosphere, yeah, yeah. <laughs> attitude and everything. I mean, it'll be it, it should be pretty incredible. And some yeah. of the, you know, like this, there's four of them and some of the, the, just the little descriptions where she's going to be a, a governess, you know, like a, a, I don't know what we would call that in the States, not a babysitter for more than, I, mean, I think, think Mary Poppins. Think Mary well, Poppins. I know she's scary Mary Poppins <laughs> with Missy. Yeah. Scary Mary. Um, you know, she's uh, being a detective for uh, Scotland Yard and a bunch of others. It, it sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. And Michelle Gomez has done the the role of Missy in other big uh, Finnish productions. Looks like in the uh, the Diary of River Song series five, she showed up mm -hmm. alongside mm -hmm. uh, also Derek Jacobi and mm -hmm. Eric Roberts, uh, two other versions yeah. of the master. Uh, Eric Roberts might might be my least favorite version <laughs> from the Eighth <laughs> Doctor uh, American TV movie, but uh, that would be very interesting. But uh, it, so check it out. It, it's at bigfinish.com. And as, as we always say, uh, we're going to one day get them to sponsor Secrets of Dark Dew because we send so they many should. people over there. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so now let's get to our, our topic of today, which is the Highlanders. I, I contemplated doing the whole uh, episode with my Scottish brogue, um, <sighs> but I actually want people to listen, so I won't. <laughs> well, and, and, and I, I, compl I <laughs> contemplated doing the entire episode drinking a glass of scotch, but <laughs> I decided that probably wasn't a good idea at 10 o'clock in the morning mountain time. <laughs> right. Mm. So <clears throat> it's a second Doctor story. It's uh, four episodes uh, of the, you know, the, the classic episode length of about 25 minutes each. Uh, it, it started in uh, the, the first airing was started in December of 1966 and uh, went over to uh, January of 1967. That's um, the second doctor we said, and uh, it's, it was his, um, it's the fourth season of Dr. Who, but his first, se uh, his first season, the second doctors uh, Troutman. And it, it's, it's the next it's, what is it? The second of his serials, right? Yeah. It's yep. it, it. So he is still very, very new as a character. And at this time, the audience would still have been reeling from the fact he's not William Hartnell anymore yeah. and just how and, different he is. Right. Well, and, um, and to kind of kind of throw it into the mix, too. This isn't the second story of the season. It's the fourth story of the season. The first two stories were William Hartnell stories. And then we went to yeah. Patrick Troughton. So so the sequence is the moon base in which uh in which uh, William Hartnell regenerates in the very last scene, and we only get one scene of Patrick Troughton. And then we had Evil of the Daleks, which has been reconstructed now in animation, and we reviewed that. And so this is just, The Highlanders is just the second story. So he's still settling into his personality. Yep. That You'll notice he has this obsession with hats in this episode. Every time he sees <laughs> right. a hat, he wants it. Right. Um, kind of like another Doctor in Fezzes, you mean? Or <laughs> well, Except comes up like four times in one story. Yeah. Right, right. The, the, um, uh, mm -hmm. And he's still accompanied by, uh, at the beginning, by Ben and Polly, who are with them right, correct. Uh, in the in this regeneration at the 10th planet. And um, in case you don't remember them, they're from the 1960s in England. Uh, Polly is a young modern woman and Ben is a young uh, Navy uh, sailor. Right. And... Uh, what was I going to say about them? They uh, they're they're trying to get home. That's the that's the thing. They're they, we're still in that phase where uh, 
the 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 at least the the first doctor was still trying to get get a, a handle on piloting the TARDIS to where he wanted it to go. Um, and then the what is the other notable thing about this uh, serial is that you can't watch it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in, 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 just, in the traditional the, sense. This is one of the first that was wiped. Uh, the tapes uh, I read somewhere the tapes were wiped within like two months of broadcast. Ugh, wow, uh, which is amazing to me. Um, so you can, but the audio exists because the mm -hmm. fans taped it, and it's subsequently been released in a variety of ways. Um, one of the ways is if you go to Audible dot com, which is part of yeah. Amazon. So mm -hmm. if you have an Amazon account, you have an Audible account, and uh, you can get um a version of it with linking narration to tell you what's visually happening on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, the linking narration is done by Fraser Hines, who is uh, who plays Jamie. Right. No you way. Can also, yeah, you can also <laughs> get, um, and this is how I listened to it actually, was uh, the audiobook version of the novelization. And that's mm -hmm. read by Anarchy Wills, who played Polly. Oh, Polly, yeah. Oh, funny. And she did a really good job with the, the voices and everything. Um, there was one point where I thought it actually was Patrick Troughton. She mm -hmm. just had his cadence down so well. Interesting. At one point, it was just like, wow, okay. She, of course, she knew from yeah. being in part of it. And, and both Anarchy Wills and Fraser Hines are uh, part of Big Finish Productions these days. And Fraser Hines, in a mail register, can do a dead on Patrick Troughton. So they have him playing the second doctor now. Oh, wow. Oh, wonderful. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, uh, one, one other way you one other way you can experience this or a couple uh, fans have also done fan animations of it that you can find like on YouTube. Unfortunately, they're not high quality. So I'm hoping the professional animation will be done. Yeah. They and were, they and were done quite a few years ago and they, they look like they're done pretty quickly. Yeah. Also, if you go to the BBC's website, it's kind of hard to find. The easy way to find it is just Google the Highlanders Doctor Who yep. photo novel. And on the BBC website, they have a photo novel made of telly snaps, which was mm -hmm. uh, uh, where the uh, the Beeb had hired a guy to take pictures of his TV screen. And so they have a lot of surviving stills from this story, which right. they've stitched together to make a photo novel. And, and that's, then that's, yeah. that's great when you're listening to it, that you can kind of step through yeah. those get like a, a slideshow. Get a visual sense of what was happening on screen. And I'll have a I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well, so you don't have to go uh, traipsing around in Google for that too. We'll go right to that. Um, so, uh, and I listened to it uh, as the audible uh, book of the the audio version of the original sound with linking narration, which was a lot of fun. I have to say, uh, I enjoyed mm -hmm. it more than I even thought I would because it was just uh, it was it's just it was done so well, and it goes quick. I mean. Listening to about it was a just over like an hour and a half maybe, at yeah, most something like that. Yep. You know, and it went went quick uh, like that, and it was just a lot of fun. And it where and the, the linking narration works. It, it really does. Um, it might help to listen to it while also looking at the uh, transcript. There's a website, um, mm -hmm. uh, chakatoya.net. Again, I'll put the link in the show notes so you don't have to figure that out. Um, that does all of the Doctor Who scripts and some of the some other TV series as well. But all of them are there. Transcripts done, for, I think, from people listening to the to the show as it, and then and typing it out as it goes. But it includes the linking narration, so it, they must have done it from that. Yeah, I was I was reading one site. I I had I was as I was listening on Audible. I also had a transcript and the photo novel in front of me, and I was flipping between them. And mm -hmm. it was clear that whoever did the transcript had, had listened to the same linking narration. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it 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 some of the. Uh, some of the Scottish accents were a bit a bit tough, especially mm -hmm. with the, the the less than high fidelity recording that we that we had mm -hmm. to work with there. So, well, the, yeah. and that's that's where I kind of enjoy doing the audiobook version because then, of course, as part of the novelization, they describe all that in a little bit more detail. Like you know, there's one scene where um, you know Ben and Polly kind of go at each other, give each other a hard time, and they kind of and the the uh, the novel describes how they get irritated after each other, and you're, you know this irritates. Ben is irritated by Polly because she thinks she's better <laughs> than anybody else. And, you know, yeah, he calls and her he, Duchess. He yes. doesn't in this episode, but she's kind of upper class. So he calls her Duchess. Right. So there's, right. there's a there you get a little of that kind of behind the scenes that, of course, gets played out when you watch it. You know, you see the person, you know, she gives him a hard time. You can just see that look on his face like again. You know? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, so the story but, itself, uh, we should probably get in talk about the story itself. 
it, is it's the, it's the last of the historicals of the classic era. Mm. And so it doesn't have any overt science fiction elements. The TARDIS just drop, you know, they show up on the TARDIS, they leave on the TARDIS. Other than that, no science, no overt science fiction in it. Yeah. And, um, and this was the last of the historicals until 1982 when in Peter Davison's era, they did a two parter called Black Orchid. Oh, but right. Black Orchid was, um, was fictional. It was kind of set in an early 20th century garden party, and it was entirely fictional, whereas this is based on real historical events. And one or two of the characters we meet in this actually are apparently are, were real people. Um, mm. The uh, uh, solicitor Gray, who wants to sell people into slavery in the West Indies, was a real person. And mm. I saw a reference that suggested uh, Perkins, his assistant, also was real. Interesting. Interesting. Um, yeah, I I kind of wish it just to sort of a, I'd like to see more pure historicals actually come in, come back in the mm -hmm. new right. Doctor Who, because it doesn't have to be science fiction elements. And we've, we've kind of had that this past season, but still had a little bit of the science fiction -y to which, it. Which which ones would you say? Well, Rosa. Rosa well, and Demons of the Punjab, but those are they, they both they had aliens. Ad mixture of science yeah, fiction. Yeah, I'm saying yeah. though they 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 they're kind of coming back, but not completely. They still well, have a little. Yeah. they've always and had Rosa time was travel. Probably the least. Yeah. Rosa was probably the least, just because the only real science fiction, other than of course the Doctor and Companions, was the 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 bad guy who was a time traveler as well. Yeah, yeah, but he's using weapons and there's teleporting going on and he's messing with the time stream as opposed to, I mean, he's trying to change history as right. opposed to just we're Telling here in this historical, historical period and we got to deal with this. Yeah, that's what, that's something that would be fun to see them just in a, in a historical story dealing with it on its own terms without the uh, the external uh, science fiction -y bits, which would be it just would be interesting to see how they would handle that uh, today. Um, it would be it would be fascinating. So um, just to kind of to recap the, the, the story itself, uh, our, our TARDIS crew arrives in Scotland just after the Battle of Culloden. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a sec, what that, what that means. And the, uh, the, the second doctor gains the trust of a small band of fleeing Jacobites by offering to tend to their wounded Laird, Colin McLaren. And while Polly and the Laird's daughter, Kirsty are away fetching water, they're uh, all captured by redcoats. Um, then you have Gray, who's a crooked lawyer who sells prisoners to slavery uh, in the in the New World, and uh, he's trying to sell off the Doctor and or some of the other uh, characters into All slavery. All of the men. All of the men. That's right, because Polly and Christie are 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 free for the moment, and so the the whole uh, story is how do they uh, escape the clutches of the slavers and get back to the TARDIS and save the day? So. That's it in a nutshell. So, yeah. uh, so I mentioned that it starts with the end of the Battle of Culloden, and this is 1746, and this mm -hmm. is a momentous that you know all of our our British listeners will know right off the bat what this is. But uh, for American listeners, uh, we probably should explain a little bit what uh, the, the background of this. So they've had lots of wars over in England, <laughs> yes. and um, <laughs> and this is one of them. Uh, you have a a situation where you have different contenders for who's going to be in control of the government. And one of the contenders who they refer to here is Bonnie Prince Charlie. And that was his nickname. Um, he, he's known uh, without the nickname as Charles Edward Stewart. So he's of the House of Stewart. And he was supported by many people in Scotland. Um, not all, though. And mm -hmm. uh, he was. Uh, opposed by <clears throat> the the forces of the Redcoats in this episode. And so you have um, Jamie's clan. And even though Jamie is not a, a major character in this series, it, because he's not yet a companion, uh, we are still kind of viewing things through his eyes. And so uh, his clan is, supports Bonnie Prince Charlie's claim to the crown, and they're battling these Redcoats who, who don't. And that's the, the key thing at issue here is who's going to be in control of the British government. And mm. um, and one of the things that I find fascinating is that the doctor um, is is very nonpartisan. 
in this. Yeah. But he's kind of in a kind of bizarre way um, <laughs> because he was like, once he gets arrested, he's like, he's like uh, chanting anti-government slogans in jail and gets the gets the Highlanders who were in jail who have some musical instruments to start playing one of their patriotic songs just to tweak the British guards. And <laughs> and and then um, when Jamie says, ah, so you are in favor of Bonnie Prince Charlie, he says, no, not really. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so he's just being very mischievous here, but he really kind of transcends the historical dispute which, of course, to him as an alien from another century, it's not, you know, exactly. He has a kind of detachment from human politics. You know, it's, it's one of the interesting historical elements is, is it, 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 this may seem esoteric, but it actually relates to the story is, um, as you mentioned, uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie was the last of the House of Stuart. Um, but when when uh, when the last English monarch of the House of Stuart had died in 1714 with no children, um, she was succeeded by George the First of the House of Hanover, which was a German house, and he was mm -hmm. in fact himself German. He just happened to have a maternal grandmother who was a Stuart, and that put him in the line of succession, and so he was made king instead of Charlie, um, who was the grand then... grandson of James the Second and Seventh. Um, Second of England, seventh of Scotland, or vice versa. Right. There was, but there's a there's a religious difference here too, which is that Charlie was Catholic, uh, mm. George was Protestant, and therefore, under the law at the time, Charlie could not become king. Char Charles right. Stuart. Yeah, and of my, course. My memory is he he promised to become Catholic and eventually did on his deathbed, but hadn't been before that. But he did yeah. end the right way, so that's good. And the 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 obviously they played with the 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 German connection uh, in this episode with the doctor right. becoming Doctor von Weir yes. and having a German accent. Right. Yeah. So the so Patrick Troughton in this episode plays several different parts in that he um, assumes different characters and disguises himself. Like in in fact, this is as far as I know the first instance of the Doctor in drag because he dresses up as an old woman at one point here. Um, and he, he also plays a red coat at one point and he plays Dr. Von Ver and which means so Dr. Who in German. It's Dr. <laughs> Who Vaughn is a, uh, is an honorific. So it in, yep. indicates he's upper class. Right. Um, but, but here we have the doctor on screen. So for everyone who's a proponent of, he's just the doctor, despite the show's title. No, here we have him identifying himself on screen as Doctor Who. He just says it in German. Yep. <laughs> and he actually he points it out. The, the sergeant says, Doctor Who? That's <laughs> what I said. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the soldiers also mistake him for a uh, for French at first, which is very funny because his, his accent isn't the greatest. But uh... what, one thing I like is as soon as I mean, so you're in 1746 in Scotland and you're Ben and Polly and the doctor. And as soon as you open your mouth, you're using a British accent. And the Scots immediately out you as Britishers right. or as yep. Englishers. And so um, so uh, we have uh, an immediate situation, especially for Ben and Polly, who don't immediately pretend to be German physicians. <laughs> um, ben and Polly are are clearly English and not on friendly territory, and they've got to deal with that. Right. In, in fact, Ben, it comes across, you know, he's a Navy man and he comes across as I'm, you know, I, I, I'm I'm part of the, the the you know, the British military. I'm I'm English. I'm I'm with you guys, the Redcoats. The Redcoats immediately assume that Ben and Polly are a deserter. Are deser yeah, Ben's a <laughs> deserter and that Polly's a camp yep. follower and they're they're going to string him up alongside the Scotsman. Yep. Oh, I must have missed the camp follower bit. Wow. That would have. I'll have to go back and look at the transcript I don't think and see they explicitly how explicit they say were that. about that. I don't think they'd explicitly state that, but I think the, the it was children's I, television. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the impl implication well, was clear that they expected that at minimum she she's betraying the English yeah. side. You know, and but, and, and, and well, it's it was the Scotsman who, who thought that Polly was an English camp follower. That to put it that, okay. to be clear, hmm. yeah. Okay, well, either way, it's still, I'm su a little surprised they do that on children's television. For people who may not be aware, a camp follower 
in this context is a woman who follows around military camps to care for the needs of the soldiers, uh, if I can put it that way. Yes and no. There was there, mm -hmm. there were lots of camp followers who were the wives of the soldiers who would do the cooking for them and that sort of stuff too. So okay, it, well, it could have sure, an implication. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it is very understandable why they'd think that Ben is a deserter because he's out of uniform. He's not dressed as a, as a sailor. Right. Yep. Right. Um, so, uh, so they get it from both sides. The Scotsman call them Sassanax, uh, you know, which is a Scots, a Scotch, uh, sort of term for Saxon or, you know, Englishman, uh, it, it, and, and so on and so forth. You know, one of the things that happens is, um, th they, uh, we see this so often. I was kind of wondering how often this happens. The doctor you know the the Scotsman. They take Ben and Polly, the doctor, and they're they're about to you know do them in for Englishmen. And the the doc, one of the companions calls him Doctor, and so the Laird, the the McLaren, Colin McLaren is is injured, and they say, "Oh, you're a doctor. You know we need a doctor, so we won't kill you in order to because you're going to treat this guy." And I'm I'm thinking, how often have they used that particular gag of? The doctor avoiding death at the last moment because someone uses his name slash title uh, uh, serendipitously. I've never done a count, but you're welcome it, to. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure it's more than once. Well, it's more of a rhetorical. Uh, I'm not, maybe I don't need a li literal uh, count, but mm -hmm. but it, but it's but it seems that they that they've done that a lot right from the beginning because I think that we mm -hmm. we've already already heard oh, that yeah. with the first doctor, like maybe even the first serial, but. Um, as a consequence of the title, you know, by, by calling him a doctor, I suppose. And, and well, frequently he'll blunt it by saying, I'm not that kind of doctor, but then he'll go on to try to do what he can to help anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, by the the, way, yeah go ahead. By the way, speak, since while we're talking about the front of the story, one illustration of how new Patrick Troughton is to the role and how unexpected he is for the audience, there's a great bit where they just, they've just arrived at the TARDIS. They realize they're on a battlefield the doctor immediately retreats to leave, to go back into the TARDIS. Mm -hmm. And Polly is like, doctor, you don't want us to think you're afraid, do you? And he says, why not? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's funny. I was just I literally just about to talk about that. But yeah, I tell you, it was kind of a funny, like, I don't, you know, I don't have the standard masculine worries about being thought a coward. You know, I just, well, let, let's, I yeah. don't want to get hit by a cannonball because that's what it happened. A cannonball can flying past. Um, he, he also doesn't have any objection here to using uh, to using weapons. He has very early on. He has been cock a pistol on 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 uh, their captors as they turn the tables on them. Right. He also himself points a gun at people and is, you know, apparently in earnest about being willing to use it. Right. That's right. Um, at one point, um, Alexander, who is. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. By the way. Ben, for a Navy man, has yeah. an unbelievably bad gun safety habits. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because he, like, after he's done using the pistol, he just, like, tosses it, still cocked, onto a table, and it goes off. <laughs> Although, <laughs> to be fair, they probably don't have a lot of work uh, training with uh, flintlocks in the in the Navy, even in the 60s. <laughs> All the more reason to be careful with this careful, thing. Exactly. That's true, that's true. Um the Alexander is one of the McLarens who we, we who dies very early on in this uh, in the first episode. But uh, you know when he goes out to 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 uh, attack the Englishman, he yells "Craig on tour" before he's killed, which is the uh, mm -hmm. battle cry that becomes Jamie's uh, sort of uh, signature battle cry throughout his run as a companion. Um, Allons-y. <laughs> exactly. Now, uh, Craig on tour <laughs> it mean, literally means the Boar's Rock, and it's similar to uh, the Craig on Turk which is the motto of the McLaren clan. So it's actually very uh, historically accurate that they would, they would use mm. that. So uh, uh, the, the Boar's Rock is, is in the, the, the McLaren territories. Uh, mm. So you can look that up, actually. It's on Google. It's kind of like Remember the Alamo. Yeah, sure, yes, yes, exactly. So we, have, uh, we also get introduced to the, the commissioner of prisons, Gray, um, who is this very prototypical or, or stereotypical um, how is it so sort of callous jerk, ab jerk. callous about death and destruction <laughs> about people treats people like objects you know he's he's having a picnic while the battle is going on and and muses about uh how much scotsman would sell for slavery and and is kind of uh 
uh, annoyed that more of the uh, more more Scotsmen, you know, they ran from the field and more of them didn't get uh, injured or di- or died. And I mean, he's very callous about it, uh, which is a uh, sets and, him up as the bad guy. And oddly, he's actually, I mean, as even though what he's planning on doing to them is evil, it's actually better in some ways than what would the alternative would be because the alternative is summary execution. Right. Yep. Right. The uh, the the redcoats are uh, they're are. They, as they they say, are shooting you know the the shooting the injured and hanging the wounded and you know the the prisoners, um, which would you know yeah. we would say today would be a violation of uh, you know a war crime. Um, well, they're they're explicit and, that it's that they don't consider them pris- or prisoners of war, war. prisoners of war. war. Prisoners yeah. of war. they're yeah. traitors. So right, That's they treat them as traitors would be not not war uh, war combatants. Right. Right. Prisoners of war would be like if they went to war with France or Germany and they're dealing with a foreign power, they view this as in as internal treason. And so that's why they're not considered prisoners of war. But it really brings out the brutality of this era. And I found it fascinating from a dramatic point of view, how non preachy this uh, this historical is. Mm -hmm. If, If they were doing this in modern times, we would have speeches left, right and center about about the morality of all of this. Right. And here they just show it to you and let you draw your own conclusions. And so I actually found this very refreshing. I liked being able to just see a drama and make my own conclusions about it, as negative as they were about the historical reality, without having a painful mm-hmm. paint-by-numbers connect-the-dots moralizing speech all over right. it. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, uh, the English English soldiers did not come across as sympathetic in any stretch whatsoever. They're in it for the almighty coin, and that's all there was to it. Some some of them, it, others. Eventually, were, we get an, we get one yeah. officer eventually who redeems himself. Exactly, example, actually, yeah. yeah. Um, Polly kind of comes across at least in this first in the beginning, kind of as a jerk. I think to yeah. to Kirsty. She calls her a stupid peasant when she won't give up yeah. the ring to buy back the prisoner's freedom, which we find out there's a good reason she won't give it up. It turns exactly. out it's, that's Bonnie Prince Charlie's signet ring. Um, but nevertheless, she kind of she, like, she calls her a stupid peasant. And I'm like, wow, that's kind of well, harsh. She, she does have a little bit of that Duchess attitude, but she <laughs> redeems herself, I think, by I mean, because she does form a good working partnership with, right. with right. Kirsty. By the way, in the Big Finish productions, Jamie ends up married to Kirsty and having eight children. Oh wow! Um, Interesting. Yeah, uh, I like how Polly is a fish out of water here because at one point, like she and Kirsty are, you know, eating. They're trying to, you know, eat to survive, and Polly finds a piece of hard tack, yeah, which was perfectly. They don't call it that, but that's what it is. It's um like a flour biscuit that has absolutely no flexibility to it, no sponginess because it's yep. not leavened. Right. And this was standard um, survival food, human, survival <laughs> food yeah. for yeah. centuries. I mean, guys oh, yes. in the Civil War would eat hardtack and stuff in the American Civil War. Um, and and Polly finds this piece of hardtack that and, and assumes it's a dog biscuit, <laughs> but <laughs> eats it anyway because she's so desperate. And I, I like how she's a fish out of water in that regard. I like how they don't point out that this is just normal survival rations. Yes. Um, and I like, I really like with both Ben and Polly, because they haven't been here very long. They've only been here for like four stories. They came in mm. right at the end of William Troughton's era, and they come across as very competent. We have companion right. separation early on, where the doctor's off on his own, Ben is with one group, Polly's with another, and both Ben and Polly immediately take charge and start working to change the situation. Right. Uh, right. Polly is like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna get past this soldier, and then we're gonna dress up as orange women, and then we're gonna get this done. And Ben is like a, organizing his group, and without any direction from the doctor, they're both capable organizers who are capable of functioning independently of the doctor and working to improve the situation, knowing that the doctor will eventually, you know, come in and help. But they're perfectly capable. They're not helpless when they're on their own. And I really like that. This is they display a level of competence that in modern who 
Amy eventually achieved and right. and Clara eventually achieved, but not until they traveled with the doctor for way more than four stories. That's true. Right. Yes, that is true. Yeah, it is it it is in the in the previous the serial that they were in and in this one, they they are able to 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 work independently, take initiative and, and get things done. Um so we have the 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 doctor and and Jamie and uh Colin, the head of the clan, they're thrown into this uh, dungeon in Inverness, this jail, uh, which apparently has got water in it because because they, they, there was yeah in the yeah, again, I in think the audio book. I think it's right by the right by the sea, so that it uh yeah, as the tide would come in, it would flood fill up right yeah um and uh, and, and this is where the doctor is shouting down with King George and <laughs> stuff like that just to tweak the the guards <laughs> right well then he uh, call he, 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 then he in a ruse calls himself a loyal subject to King George to the to the guards and he's he, he's sort of playing people against each other uh, i do have to note that Kirsty does seem to cry at the drop of a hat and probably criticizes mm-hmm. for it uh, mm-hmm. At least in the early going, later on she kind of bucks up. Well, a she, bit. she she kind of toughens up, not really toughens up, but she kind of smartens up, kind of throughout, and kind of takes on a little bit of Polly's personality too. You know this, where she kind of starts, starts play, they start playing off each other mm-hmm. as it goes along towards the end. Uh, at one point, Polly and Kirsty they get the drop on this uh, this, this British lieutenant uh, Algernon Finch, or as Polly keeps calling him. For Finch, because he has two F's in his thing. <laughs> I know that's that's. I love how she just keeps doing that through the whole rest of the story. Or <laughs> Algernon for Finch. Algie. Algie. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, in the end, it's kind of funny how it, by by the end of it, she's the you know, Algie. You know, Algie sort of has a thing for Polly. I mean, there's this, yeah. actually this and little she, spark that that comes. Yeah, and and so he's one of the officers that ends up redeeming himself. Just yep. to flash forward for a second, he he ends up helping her out at the end of the story in a, in a situation where it's clear he's being sincere. And as she leaves, she gives him a kiss on the cheek. So so that was very nice. Yep. Uh, also, notice English people therefore are not purely bad in this story. Right. Which correct. is also you know now i i don't think they would ever probably do english people are purely bad in any given historical era given that it's an english show right but they have not returned that favor for some other countries <laughs> i could name um <laughs> or parts of go guys. back a few episodes of secrets yeah. of doctor who if you if you want to know what we're referring to <laughs> yeah. just leave it we should but, just leave it at that <laughs> but what i like is that we have a com- a more complex portrayal of even uh of, of this society you have yep. some on the English side who now we don't really have any any uh, Scotsmen who are portrayed as evil, although we are told about some mm-hmm. um, who were like who, traitors and stuff. Um, but on the English side, we have people who are just summarily executing people yep. to p- people like Finch, who were selling them into slavery to people like the Finch, who end up. Uh- doing good gray was selling and, him into slavery but yeah and gray finch was, was selling him into slavery yeah and finch was doing good but then also we have like uh perkins who's gray's assistant who is he does what he's told but he really doesn't like it and when the mm-hmm. tables are finally turned on gray he can reveal just how much he dislikes gray and stuff so we have mm-hmm. we have a um a, a complex portrayal of the unsympathetic side yes um, there exactly. is a there is a moment where uh, where the doctor gets the drop on uh, Gray, the, the the commissioner of prisons, by tricking him with um, Colin had uh, taken Charlie's uh, Prince Charlie's uh, standard, his flag, and had been hiding it on himself. And the doctor had taken it from him and had used that as a way to get in with uh, Gray to tell him that hey, if you know you mm-hmm. and I can split the reward for finding Prince Charles. Uh, if and then he gets the drop on him, he throws it over his head and takes the gun, and yeah. uh, and and ties him up, and then makes lawyer jokes. <laughs> like, yeah, I've yeah. never seen a silent <laughs> lawyer before. It's just it was, it was a funny moment. I, I like how he then he then um he's he's dealing with uh Perkins another Perkins. person Perkins afterwards, and he's he's put on the Doctor Von Wur persona, and he's he's going he's just talking to him and and perkins is so suspicious of what's happening and he's like man your eyes and he starts going on about perkins's eyes and then as if there's some medical diagnosis here and is you must be getting headaches (laughs) and he's like 
no, not really. And he slams his head on the table. No headaches? Really? Are you sure that you have a headache? And, and he ends up bamboozling uh, Perkins into like thinking he needs to put a cloth or, or something over his eyes and yeah. keep him closed for 10 minutes while he escapes. And that, it, it's just that, a lot of fun. That's one of those scenes I was listening to. I really wish we could watch because, you know, that'd yeah. be so funny to watch Patrick <laughs> Trout with that little devilish grin that he puts on and going, oh, no headaches. Slam. Are you sure? <laughs> Slam. Are you really sure? You know? <laughs> Cause he hits about two, three times. Yes, he does. Oh, uh, yeah. That was a pretty funny uh, scene. Um, the, we, we eventually get um, the introduction of the, the, the captain of the slave ship that, that, that Gray is in league with, um, named Trask. Uh, and he's very typically a pirate sort of character because he says R a lot, which is really fun. Yeah. <laughs> you don't get well, that much a, these days. Stereotypical pirate. He took over the ship from his previous master who was locked up in the hold. Right. 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 It's the, uh, the ship is the Annabelle and it's in Inverness Harbor. And that's where Ben and Jamie and eventually end up over there. They get, they get carted off. Uh, sold into the slavery. Um, uh, meanwhile, well, that's where where they're gonna get transported to the West Indies, right? To right, be sold. to be mm-hmm. sold. That's right. Sorry, yeah. Uh, to be and, clear, and to prove how serious this is, as soon as they get to the Annabelle, they've got like a soldier that they've tied up, and they and even though he's tied up, they immediately chuck him into the water right. to drown. <laughs> that's our that's our uh, episode two cliffhanger. And it's like, okay, this is Chekhov's ducking because it, <laughs> yeah. you've just thrown yep. one person tied up into the sea. This is going to happen to one of our main characters later. Right. Um, now, Polly and Kirsty, meanwhile, as you mentioned earlier, Jimmy, are they're going to disguise themselves as orange women, which which is they're 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 basically a lower class or poor women who go around selling oranges. And Kirsty is very not liking having to play an well, uh, 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 it- orange seller. Exactly. And uh, Polly makes an allusion to that will probably go by American listeners. She alludes right. to someone called Nell Gwynn, yep. who I'm sure most Americans have never heard of. Nell Gwynn was a, uh, I guess, mistress of, I forget who, but it was a high government official. King Charles II. And, okay. Yes. And, um, and she had, a, she also knew this woman who was a former prostitute named Orange Mall. And Orange Mall ran a group of, of women who were called Orange Girls. And what they would do, oranges were like a delicacy mm-hmm. at this time. You, they were not common food. They, they, came, they don't grow in England, and so they, they have to be imported. Right. And at the time, they were very exotic. And so, and that, um, so what would happen... Go ahead. I was going to say, that, that's why in England it, it's... Still a tradition to give oranges on Christmas. Right. Yeah. It's a treat. Because yeah. it was such a rare, special treat. Yeah. Whereas in California, where I am, they literally grow on trees. <laughs> um, but uh, but in any event, uh, so there were these orange girls. And what they would do is they would go to the theater and sell oranges. I mean, you would sell oranges to guys like soldiers and stuff, but you'd also sell them to theater patrons. And so Orange Mall had this ring, um, I guess connected somehow with Nell Gwynn, where uh, they would sell oranges to the theater patrons, and the theater patrons, would the men, would have the orange girls pass messages to the actresses backstage Mm. to arrange assignations with them. Yeah. And so forth. So this is another kind of low class, fringy thing that's right. bordering on prostitution here. Well, the, the connection Nell Gwynn, because she says, oh, you know, it's like a Nell Gwynn thing. It, Nell Gwynn was one of the first English actresses because bef- mm-hmm. th- before that, all you know, sh- famously in Shakespeare, okay, all yeah. the women were men. Um, but uh, so I think it was also a reference to uh, we have to we're going to dress up and play at this role. Like, uh-huh. like actresses too, I think. So there's, uh, I think there's the the dual understanding there uh, with it. But uh, yeah, so Nell Gwynn would have, you know, she died uh, less than a hundred years before th- this took place, like maybe sixty or seventy years before this, or maybe eighty years before this took place. Not, not that Kirsty would have heard of an actress down in London, which she apparently has not heard of. Right. Right. So th- there's this extended b- bit in in this uh, in, in the third episode where Gray is trying to convince the the Scottish prisoners on the ship 
to sign contracts to become slaves in the West Indies. So well, technically, probably indentured it, servant, but right, essentially se- slaves. Seven, seven year labor contracts. And then once they're down there, he's just going to sell them into slavery and they're never getting out of there. Right. But the contracts <laughs> become, a, you know, for him, would be justification if someone ever said, Yo, you what did you do with these prisoners? Oh, they all signed contracts to go become indentured servants rather than you know, lang- languish in prison. Um, which, I did them a favor. He, which he yeah. tried to do and kind of backfired on him a little bit. <laughs> right. Well, at the end. It, yeah, right, exactly. Um, in fact, uh, Ben, uh, you know, so, pretends to want to sign and then t- grabs him and tears up the contracts. <laughs> all of them. So they're all invalid. <laughs> right. And, and yep. now when this happens, so this really happened. This, this is part of history. Um, mm-hmm. Someone did rip up uh, Gray's contracts, not Ben, obviously, but someone did. And when I saw Ben do that, I, I thought, well, wait a minute, would that really stop a contract from being valid? Because um, otherwise you could invalidate anything just by tearing it up. And and I thought there's got to be some legal way around this. Turns out the real life Gray had one. He had the men sign his own body. Um, and okay. so, so he got the signatures another way. <laughs> huh. Yeah, I guess you're not going to tear, tear up his, maybe, yeah, maybe. Uh, so, yeah. um, so the doctor uh, now wants to convince Kirsty to steal the ship with, you know, to help him steal the ship, the Annabelle, and sail and send it to the West Indies to sail with her father and their people to France. Um, and he yeah, almost tells and, her, you don't have to be there for seven years because you'll be able to come back after that. Like, he almost spills the beans on the historical of the yeah, uh, future. Yeah, he kind of pauses, uh, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Polly glosses over it. So, see, the doctor says you won't have to be away for very long, ignoring right. the seven years he just blurted out. Right, yep. right. Um, it, and like, as I said, it turns out that Kirsty's ring is Prince Charles' uh, signet ring, and the doctor is going to use that as bait. So he's he's already used Prince Charlie's standard as bait now he's going to use the ring as as bait for a trap um and and he goes out and buys a whole bunch of weapons for the english to to kind of arm their their little rebellion here and their their uh, taking the of the ship which is i just think is hysterical that they buy the weapons from the english to to, to fight to the english. rearm the scots yes yeah yeah they, what these weapons are they're not the service weapons that the Redcoats have their weapons that the Redcoats have collected from the battlefield as souvenirs. Right. Mm. Yes. Exactly. And uh, and so the doctor shows up with a wheelbarrow full of them. Uh, it, you know, after Kirk, Kirsty and uh, and Polly end up with one or two each. Um. So we the we uh, start episode four, the final episode of the of oh, the with and our our cliffhanger for three was Ben gets ducked. Right. So right. he's tied up and thrown into the sea. Uh, Or well, tied up and dropped into the sea by a rope, and then when they pull the rope up, Ben is no longer attached to it. Right, and and Ben, you know, got himself untied, swam under the ship, and swam to shore. And keeping in mind that even many sailors of that era didn't know how to swim, so throwing someone into the water. Yeah, what is up with that? <laughs> People just didn't learn to swim. Gonna gonna work in this environment. That would seem to be one of the first things you'd want to learn. <laughs> you would think. No, uh, obviously, the Navy has learned that lesson since, but <laughs> <laughs> right, definitely right. didn't at that time. And the way Ben, uh, Polly later asks Ben, how did you get out of the of being tied up? And he says, I used the old Houdini trick. Not apparently implying that he'd met Houdini, but just that he knew that Houdini would like <laughs> stretch his body as far as he could while being tied. So you could then relax afterwards yep. and slip out of the bonds. Right. Right. The old exactly. trick. Um, the, uh, th- so the doctor's ruse for gray, who, who he manages to, to, to regain his confidence, even after he dropped the drop of him, tied him up and put him in a cupboard. He's, he manages to regain Gray's confidence and, and tells him that, you know, look, I've got his ring. Prince Charles, is disguised among the prisoners on the Annabelle. Um, meanwhile, as Jamie, as J- Jamie, exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> meanwhile, Ben and Polly sneak aboard, um, and th- they they manage to to pass a, a bunch of weapons through the portholes to the prisoners uh, aboard, so that when Gray is there and uh, it, it, the other it, you know, the the Trask and others, they end up uh, uh, getting the drop on them and getting themselves free, and then the ship. 
uh, what they, 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 it sails for France and, yep. um, with, uh, the, the former captain was in the hold. So he's, he takes uh, command of the ship, um, um, uh, Willie Mackey and, uh, they sail for France, but Jamie stays behind because the doctor and Polly and, and Ben have to figure out how to get back to the TARDIS. Yeah. Yeah. Now this is not really believable. The real reason is because Jamie's about to become a companion and that's the on-screen exactly. explanation. Right. Uh, it's interesting. It's interesting. It was not originally decided if Jamie was going to be a companion or not. Um, <clears throat> uh, and the decision was actually made during filming. Uh, mm. There was another ending where <clears throat> there was another ending where uh, Jamie stayed behind and said goodbye to them. But uh, he worked so well and had such good on-screen presence and chemistry with the cast that they decided to make him a companion while they were filming. And so uh, Fraser Hines tells a story about how the the showrunner at the time, uh, you know, came up to him and said, hey, you want to be a companion? And said, sure. And so they did this ending where he goes with them. And uh, I like how uh, the doctor consents, because it's Ben and Polly who advocate Jamie being a companion. And the doctor says, okay, if, he'll, if he agrees to teach me the bagpipes. And Jamie says, sure. But then I don't know that we ever follow up on that. <laughs> no. Little, uh, little did they know how well he would work as a companion. You know, right. he's, to this day, he's still considered one of, the, one of the great companions of the doctor. And he would yeah. be with the doctor to, through the, throughout his entire run to the very end yes, of the, the second, second doctor. doctor. And, and even after, when, when uh, Patrick Troughton would come back, Jamie would come back too. And they have a great chemistry together. They the base they basically establish because Patrick Troughton is already a kind of childlike figure, mm -hmm. and so they establish a kind of brother relationship yes. where where uh, the Doctor is the older brother and Jamie is the younger brother, and they kind of squabble and test each other a little yep. bit, but they really love each other. Well, it's it, one thing you'll hear a lot is the doctor will say, isn't that right, Jamie? I wait, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so in the end, uh, for Finch arrests Gray and lets the doctor go uh, you know, just before they get to the, you know, into the turn. Should have written, should have written those names on his body. It's the absence of the contracts that does him in. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, and, but he, he lets the doctor go because like I said before, he, he turns out he's sweet on Polly, uh, despite her getting the drop on him and, uh, blackmailing him, uh, threatening to tell his uh, superiors that he was captured by a couple of girls, uh, which is kind of <laughs> a funny little circumstance. Um, and they get on board. Now, a couple of little notes that are interesting about this. The director of this serial, his name is Hugh David. Yeah. He was considered for the role of the first doctor when the show was first being created, but had been passed over because he was too young. He was only 38, um, which is way hmm. too young to be the first doctor, I think. Uh, <laughs> says I, who's so did they? Yes, so is uh, says I, who's almost the same age as uh, as uh, William Hartnell was. Um, but uh, so that I thought that was an interesting a little bit there uh, on that, and that this is the only Doctor Who story written by Jerry Davis that does not feature the Cybermen. Another right. another little uh, trivial tidbit. Um, so any uh, any before, I want to get some listener feedback, but before we do that, any last notes that for from either of you on this uh, episode, Father uh, uh, Jimmy, you you probably have something. I I just want to say how much I enjoyed it, uh, despite the fact yeah. this was a serial. It was only uh, despite the fact this was a historical. It was only four parts. It was a nice adventure tale. That's all mm -hmm. it needs to be. Um, the Doctor. We didn't have. Lots of philosophy here. I liked how the doctor and his companions worked in this situation and what they had to deal with. And we have a nice adventure story, and it's yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah, it's, I'll, I'll definitely, I'll echo that. It was a, again, listening to the audiobook version of it was was a was a blast. You know, to have the little telesnaps as we went along and everything, and mm -hmm. and uh, just just to, you know a good story. You know, you, you don't always need the 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 vi visual to to tell a good story you know of course that's why we you know we we do talk about the big finish stories and things like that you know those old radio dramas and stuff like that did such a great job of telling a good story and uh audiobooks like these this novelization same thing you know but but by the way father just to mention since i I don't know if we've mentioned the novelizations very often before on the program, but right, I think they, this is the first time we've talked about it. So, yeah. yeah, they actually played a big role in the history of Doctor Who fandom, because after the tapes were destroyed for a lot of series and and even 
after that, after they stopped destroying the tapes, there was no Doctor Who home video for decades. I mean, for a long time into the mm -hmm. show. And so you couldn't just watch a DVD of a previous show. The only way an ordinary person had to experience a previous show was listen to the audio tape if you personally taped it, which right. very few people did. The only other way was to buy one of the novelizations that mm -hmm. was done. And so over the course of time, all kinds of stories got novelized. I mean, there's a huge yep. number of these little short Doctor Who novels. And that was how fans experienced Doctor Who after it yep. had been on the air until the rise of, of commercial home video. Right. So these yeah. were actually very important in the history of Doctor Who fandom. Yeah. And, you know, and like novelizations today, they're not one to one. They're not exactly word for word. They tell the same story. They have, you know, it's the same plot and everything. But the, I, I noticed kind of going through that, you know, they, they kind of changed some scenes up a little bit, just, you know, yeah. changed orders of scenes, changed a couple of lines. Again, very, very minor changes. Does absolutely nothing to affect the story. Did absolutely nothing, you know, very, very few changes. But, you know, just it, it and I, I suppose and it because obviously it fit the novel format better than it did as the original story would have. They were also written by Doctor Who writers, so mm -hmm. it would it, sometimes by the same writer who wrote the TV episode, but other times by uh, a different writer for the TV show, and they would fill in things and explain things uh, that couldn't be done on screen, like tell you a background explanation for why something happened that was kind of mysterious in the show itself, and mm -hmm. for that reason, they're often considered kind of important um, resources that fill right. in things uh that yeah. otherwise don't make sense yeah like like in this case going back to who wrote it the the uh, the novelization was written by jerry davis who was one of the writers of the original story awesome thanks yeah that uh so folks could you know go back and check some of those out that would be awesome uh good idea so uh i want to uh, go in through some listener feedback we got some great feedback from folks on previous episodes uh this one goes way back to episode 79 of the secrets of doctor who to our discussion of uh, the Tenth Doctor story with the two-part, The Impossible Planet and The Satan Pit, um, Catherine O'Hare says uh, on, on Facebook, she says, this is the, the first episode that really pulled me into the podcast. So uh, welcome, yeah. Catherine, uh, to the podcast. Uh, she says, it was a great balance of fandom and theology aspects. My favorite episodes are when the group drops some theology into the topic. I think she means uh, us <laughs> into the topic, mm -hmm. uh, which is granted <laughs> easier on some topics than others in science fiction. Um, we like to use connections like this in youth ministry. So I shared SQPN with our team. Yay, Catholic nerds, is, is how she signs off. So, <laughs> awesome. I agree. <laughs> thank you. And welcome, Catherine. Thank you for sharing the SQPN and the Secrets of Doctor Who with, with folks. Because, uh, again, like I said before, this is a wonderful, uh, wonderful way of spreading the news. Um, and then on our the first part of our uh, looking at seat back at season 11 uh, retrospective, um, Amy Flowers comments, um, the uh, only one immediate thought is I hope they don't make Yaz and Ryan romantically linked. We kind of speculated uh, whether that might be a way they'll they'll increase Yaz's involvement in the series. She said mm -hmm. that Yaz should have her own growth and not have it connected to anyone else to that degree. She hasn't had much development and I'd rather see her grow as a person instead of have it defined as part of a relationship. I, you know, I, I understand that sentiment. Um, I, I wouldn't view having a relationship though, as a negative thing. Um, the, I mean, that's the essence of every single, I mean, that's Romeo and Juliet. That's every mm -hmm. single romance that's ever been written is you have two people who fall in love with each other. I think it would humanize Ryan as well. I think Ryan yeah. is, is uh, someone that I've mentioned, he comes across as complaining way too much to me. And I'd like <laughs> to see another side of him that could get brought out by his relationship with Yaz. So I, it, it, it's all about, um, I mean, I don't see a problem with, uh, with characters relating to each other, whether it's romantically or in some other way. Right. I'd like to see Yaz get more to do on the show. And I wouldn't mind seeing another side of Ryan as well. So I think they could potentially work well together from a writing perspective. Yeah, it's like I can I can see both sides of the the, the argument, um, both for a relationship yeah. and against relationship, because it seems um, so much that if there's a man and a woman who are major characters in a series, at some point, a relationship has to develop. 
Right. You know, it's, if, just, it always, if, always, it's that's such a trope that you see everywhere in TV today. But but it, I, I don't think it's unrealistic to this situation because if you no, have, I, I, I don't I mean, disagree. I'm not. You if, know. <laughs> if you're a young man or or a young woman, romance is somewhere in your mind, unless well, sure. you know you're very abnormal. And who who in this circumstance, if you're in this time traveling lifestyle, who else are you going to connect with? Right. right. Um, it naturally makes sense, given the situation, for them to be thinking about each other. And I wouldn't mind seeing them explore that. Um, I don't, well, now, see, I don't, if, I don't disagree. Uh, like I said, I can see both sides of the argument, you know. Yeah. Now, if they had something else to do with Yaz, I think that would be fine, too. Uh, I'm just saying this is an obvious thing to me, given that it makes sense for their situation. And I think it could help their characters, but it's not the only way to help their characters. I, I think the key would be is, is to avoid what what has happened in the, the DC comic superhero TV shows, which the, right. the relationship stuff becomes a big soap opera and, and mm -hmm. sort of distracts yeah. from. And that was that was yeah. what most behind my thoughts as well. Yeah. You know? Yeah, we don't want to have, you know, the long periods of angsty talk about, does she really like me? You know, that sort of stuff. Yeah, no, I, I don't want a soap opera. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's good. But thank you, Amy, for, for that uh, the, the, the comment. It was a, a good thought. Good thought. So we'd like to take a moment here uh, to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create Secrets of Doctor Who. Um, and today we especially want to thank by name uh, Michelle M., Daniel B., Dante V., Caroline K., and Wendy T, through their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give, they make it possible for us to continue The Secrets of Doctor Who and all the shows that we do at sqpn.com. And if you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. What do you think of The Highlanders? Did you give it a listen? Um, are you going to give it a listen now? Uh, did you have any comments on what we had to say about it? Let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page and leave some feedback or send us an email to doctorwho at sqpn.com. You can find the, all those links that we talked about before on our show notes at sqpn.com. We'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the third Doctor story, The Ambassadors of Death. Until then, Father Corey Stika, thank you for joining me in sharing The Secrets of Doctor Who. I'm glad to be here and thank you, Dom. And Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest. And remember, that can be only one! Right. This is gonna be fun.